very insightful one. We're going to discuss about the building of resilience through research and policy. So we all know that at Arain, we do have these Friday reviews just to peer learn and co-create evidence which can be shared out there to produce something which is feasible for transformation of both the people at the local level and even the national or county levels. So having said that, I'll just briefly discuss about why we need to build resilience, uh, especially to these local people whom we're targeting. Uh, we all know that climate change is something that's well known, uh, especially these people who attend the conferences, the co-op and everything. But the people at the ground level are still lagging behind. They're still uh, being affected by this climate change and they face this uh, impact at a very high rate. So this makes it important for the researchers and the policy makers to collaborate in building this resilience. So we need to carefully examine our surroundings and develop these thoughtful plans, which can equip ourselves with tools that can fortify these communities and system against these unexpected challenges. So uh, our speaker for today will take us through this topic to tell us why we need this collaboration, why we need to understand the complexity of these problems, and also why this partnership will empower us to proactively face the future and ensure that uh, our collective effort pave the way for a resilient and adaptive world tomorrow. Uh, our speaker, uh, I'll introduce him, is called Samuel. Samuel is a researcher, a research associate at Circuit Africa. I hope I pronounced it well. He's part of the wet lab team and is mainly involved in various aspects uh, in genotyping. He also provides technical support in molecular biology laboratory work. Uh, prior to joining SECOT, he worked as a research associate uh, at the Integrated Genotype Support and Service, that the IGSS platform, under the Becker Ilri Hub. So Mr. Samuel, kindly, uh, the platform is yours. Take us through the presentation. In case you'll have a problem or rather a question or a concern or a view amidst the presentation, feel free to write in the comment section or you can wait till the end, then you raise your hand. Uh, the, that's all. Mr. Samuel, please take us through the presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Lavenda, for the uh, presentation uh, introduction. Uh, so uh, as I as you have explained to the participants that uh, my background is in biotechnology, so I'm uh, I'm trained uh, in biotechnology and uh, currently working at a uh, hosted institution is called Secat Africa that is based at International Livestock Research Institute. So I reason why I decided to take this topic is because of the nature of work that we are working on. I mean the the kind of uh, docket that I've been involved in. I'm a researcher by profession, so most of uh, the, our work involves uh, hands-on, hands-on um, handling samples from farmers, from research, uh, research agricultural research institutions, and uh, through this information, we are able to to guide uh, policymakers uh, in terms of uh, maybe which varieties of crop to to advance. So, without wasting much time, I'm going to go straight forward uh, to my presentation. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, I hope you are all able to see my screen. Lavenda? Yes, we can. Yes. So my topic uh, for today, I chose... Um, on resilience, uh, that is building climate change resilience through research and policy. Um, as you are aware, climate change poses significant challenges in Africa with impacts of changes in temperature, precipitation patterns, extreme weather conditions, per persistent drought, floods, and rise, or I mean sea level rise. Uh, African countries, uh, we are vulnerable to climate change due to the our dependence on mostly rain-fed ag agriculture, also limited resources, uh, infrastructure, and socioeconomic challenges. Other than climate change, we have uh, we have had in the past uh, invasion of locusts, you are aware about that. Uh, also increasing uh, prices for global commodities, COVID-19, have uh, placed sub-Saharan African food system under strain. So therefore building resist, the resilience in the face of climate change is crucial for the sustainable development of the continent. 
So like most of the Africa, Sub-Saharan African countries, Kenya agricultural composition also has been impacted uh, by climate change because 89% of the land that is uh, we are farming is currently the, uh, from arid and semi-arid regions. Uh, when I saw this topic, uh, because you know I'm, I'm a researcher from most of our work involves, I'm actually based in the lab, most of the time I'm in the lab, I thought that uh, we need to break a barrier. Uh, I mean, we need to, to develop a, a way we are able to communicate with the people, just local people on the ground. Uh, and, I mean, from the, whatever you are producing in the, in the lab and our scientific work that we are doing. So that's why I put this slide uh, showing that uh, you can see from up top, top left to the bottom. They sometimes we have uh, the scientific actors. They publish papers based on on uh, predictions that they, they they normally see for weather patterns. Uh, from IPCC also we have the the reports of uh, increasing surface temperature and the projection that we have. So this all this information we need to know how we can be able to break it down to our policy make, policy makers uh, so that they can be we can be able to have interventions before before it is too late uh, another issue that came along since uh, my background is in biotechnology uh, we have had this issue of uh, genetically modified organisms that is gmos in africa generally and um, I, i'm not actually promoting the gmo uh, but i'm just saying about the perception that we have for from the public so as as scientists in the lab we work we make sure that we are working to, uh, very hard to, and we do a lot of scientific event test. And uh, it is clear from this statement that it is one thing for general, generally welfare consumers in the developed world to deny GMOs a place in the market, but their unfold fears have significant knockout effects in many poor uh, African countries and Asian countries, where they base their GMO policies on a scientific policy that pervades the developed world, world, fear of what the adoption of GM crops might mean for trade uh, neighbors and the European. So what I noted is uh, in most of these African countries, uh, a lot of public and uh, politicians, they fear a lot of uh, what will happen to the trade restrictions and all this. Uh, so that we, we need actually to demystify the myths about uh, science so that we can be able to guide uh, our policy makers when they are, make, may, they are making this uh, decision. Also, even how we communicate, you can see, for example, these, uh, uh, it was from a newspaper where they have, they they sometimes the way they portray the GMOs, how they we, they actually the work that is being done to develop the crop, uh, it puts a lot of uh, fear for in public, and you find that most of these technologies are not adopted and they don't end up helping the farmers. I mean, at the end of the day, so we need to think about uh, how we can be able to integrate science uh, and the policy. So we need to have uh, timely and relevant information sharing. Farmers are increasingly uh, vulnerable to climate and other shocks. So the science that we produce in the in our work, uh, researchers, I mean, we are researchers, most of us in our institutions. So we need to have this research, uh, research information or research data going directly to the farmers on, and to the policy ma makers on time. So like when we had the drought, we need to have this information reaching very fast to, um, I mean, to farmers, to to other people, so that we can be able to maybe to promote drought tolerant varieties, and these varieties can be able to uh, be adopted by farmers and people who are the direct benefit. Other than that, um, we need to understand the impact of the policy uh, when it comes to the decision that we are making. So when you just say that we are not going to promote any GMO work in the in, in the in African continent, it means that we are losing from our side, because uh, at all, if we if we compare ourselves with the developed countries, we are far much behind, and we need to embrace science uh, to guide us in terms to solve our solutions that the problems that we have in the country. So we need to build resilience in the in the face of climate change. Africa requires a comprehensive and multifaceted approach that combines research and policy interventions. Effective policy uh, needs research-based development. Uh, basically, that's what I was just trying to summarize. Uh, also, 
the issue of uh, climate change and how we can become resilient. I mentioned that um, in Africa, of course, you are aware that we are the least responsible, but we are the hardest hit. We don't, uh, our contribution towards the pollution is is negligible. It's not even, uh, you can't compare ourselves with developed countries. Uh, one of the most vulnerable continents uh, to climate change and climate variability due to partly uh, climate exposure, but also to low adaptive, adaptive capacity. So we don't have the capacity to handle uh, droughts, uh, floods, uh, that's, we are very vulnerable. Uh, something else that I came across is that uh, we are currently having uh, water, water, water related issues, and uh, it is projected that by 2030, um, uh, around 700 million of Africans will be displaced. Uh, we have conflicts related to water. Uh, in terms of agriculture also, we need to think about how we can be able to solve uh, malnutrition. Uh, uh, something that came up is uh, we have poverty problems uh, based on malnutrition because uh, we don't have enough food to feed the, our continent. Unlike, unlike developed countries, uh, our, Africa, uh, our agriculture in Africa is based on uh, it's rain fed. So the issue of also uh, resilience, it brings about vulnerability. So we are vulnerable to climate change. And um, not only the climate change, but we have also issues to do with um, our, our, our farming system. We are smallholder farmers, most of the African countries, like in Kenya, a majority of the farmers that produce are small scale farmers. We have also issues to do with the poor soil quality, like most of the soil is acidic. Um, the use of fertilizers, we find that uh, a lot of farmers are not able to use uh, uh, fertilizers to be able, be able to improve their their crops. We are also susceptible to pests and diseases, and uh, not only the pests and diseases. When we harvest our crops, we we have challenges of uh, how we store this uh, this crop. Most of these uh, crops end up uh, being wasted because we cannot be able to store it, store it uh, properly. Also, we have also problems to do with the uh, marketing markets. So we have a lot of issues in uh, in Africa that we, that's why we are mostly vulnerable. So uh, I say that also Africa is vulnerable to uh, I'm just this statement I've repeated again. So I just go straight forward. This is a picture showing um, the desert locusts. You remember in 2020 there was we had this plague uh, caused by the desert locust, and uh, this this one we can relate it to climate change because. Um, desert locusts are typically solitary species. Actually, uh, when I did my research on the desert locust, I found that uh, when it is solitary, that is when it is not in so many numbers, the locusts are not harmful. But um, when they become many, that is when they become pests. And this was attributed because of uh, in 2019, there was heavy rains that uh, were experienced across the Indian Ocean uh, Dipole. And uh, as a result, it led to mass breeding of these locusts. Uh, because now, you know, we, in Africa now, we didn't have a lot of surveillance. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we were not prepared in terms of capacity. So uh, we suffered a lot. Uh, uh, most of the farmers suffered losses, crop losses, because of the, the desert locusts. Because you can imagine the locusts can be able to travel one kilometer, uh, 150 kilometers per day. You can imagine the also the size of, of destruction that it's caused. So going to the adaptation strategies that we need to discuss as, um, as, as African, we, we need to know how we, can we be able to mitigate, how can we be able to, to adapt to the changing climate and, and, um, and be able to sustain our population, our increasing population and, and decreasing land size. So African countries are implementing various adaptation strategies to cope with this impact of climate change. These strategies include uh, sustainable water practices, water management, uh, early warning systems for extreme weather, uh, and the development of, of climate resilient infrastructure. Integrated approaches that uh, addresses both climate change and development goals are gaining importance. So uh, part of the strategies that uh, that I, we think that uh, from my research can be able to be applied 
is on the climate research. We need to, uh, to continue supporting uh, climate related research so that we can be able to have informed uh, policy decision making. Research in policy decision making is supported in establishing scientific courses and uh, making fact informed predictions about effectiveness, both achieved by means of varied, precise, rigorous method of inquiry. Yeah, and um, there's a very nice book that I've shared there. Maybe you can have uh, much of my points I was able to get from uh, a book that was launched recently by IFPRI, that is International uh, Policy Institution. And it, it actually highlights uh, what it actually acts as a reference material of what, how we need to adapt, how we can be able to relate uh, science, uh, uh, policy, and uh, and issue of climate change mitigation. Uh, another tool that I came across was uh, particip participatory action research. Uh, this one is very important because we are able to involve the community. It's one tool being used in adaptation to climate change through shared learning uh, among researchers and most affected. That is uh, getting this, having this uh, research from uh, what's happening across uh, our communities and institutions. It, it is important that it is going to guide policy making decision. So also I need to invest in uh, climate res res uh, research specifically to Africa regions to understand local climate patterns, vulnerability, potential impact, establish and enhance uh, meteorological climate monitoring and early warning systems. So for example, the recently El Nino rain we had, uh, so farmers were able to prepare in time and also try also to control areas that are prone to flooding. And this information is, this research is important uh, towards um, avoiding catastrophes. Uh, we also need to strengthen capacity of farmers making uh, uh, strengthening capacity of farmers involves making adapt adaptation options available to them through research and development, and accessing uh, providing training and extension services to them. So uh, we need to have a point on you know what whatever we are working on in in the labs and in our research institutions. We need to have them uh, directly going towards the farmer. For example, we have this. Uh, I came across this Nuru Nuru Smart App that is developed by International Center for Potato Research. So the the app is able to screen. Um, you're able to screen in the farm. Uh, in in the farm, you're able to screen whether your crop has is infected with a virus, or if the, if, if you see it has any a disease, you're able to screen using the app. And you're able to diagonize uh, on, I mean, on site. You don't have to use resources whereby you have to send this sample to be tested in a particular lab for the specific pathogen or pest. So we need to have uh, solutions. We need to promote this kind of solutions so that we are able to mitigate. Um, we are able to have cushion the farmers because you know uh, all these diseases and pests. They are a result of climate change. Uh, when you have climate change, increasing of, of temperatures, we have uh, viruses and bacteria and pests, multiplication also. So we also need to adopt and see how we, we can be able to, as science, how science can be able to help uh, solve this issue. Uh, another thing that we need to work on is, um, as scientists, is to keep on uh, uh, developing uh, varieties that are that are adaptive to the changing climate, like drought, drought tolerant varieties. We also need to uh, see how we can be able to do cropping uh, system, like um, which can be able to manage uh, the soil and uh, agroforestry, uh, not cutting down the trees. And I mean, all these things, diversification is very important uh, towards mitigation of uh, and adaptation of climate change. Uh, as I said, as I shared that earlier, you see that this is the effects of climate change on crops. Changing climate, I mean, uh, when you have uh, heat, drought, we need to research uh, towards uh, the issues that we are facing. So when, for, for example, in crops, uh, in, in, in my institution where I work, we, we actually try to help farmers and breeders uh, to research more on on um, on different topics on on crop uh, growth, for example, maybe you find a researcher is working on on the grain on the grain of a specific crop. 
Uh, so like they want to increase the green, the, the, the quantity uh, because of uh, the small the small lands that we have. Uh, we also have also researchers working on, on livestock research uh, who are also doing uh, a lot of work towards coming up with, with breeds that are able to uh, as, as, uh, to resist, I mean, their stress, they're able to resist heat stress and many other uh, factors. So I just give a brief uh, a thought of adding a slide of where I work uh, because it was related to my presentation. Uh, we are hosted at International Drive Stock Research Institute, uh, it's called SECAT Africa. So part of our services that we offer, um, I thought of introducing the topic called genotyping because we actually apply molecular marker technology to uh, help uh, improve uh, crop and livestock uh, breeding programs. So we have the capacity in terms of, in Africa, we, we have the capacity to, uh, as researchers, to be able to advise the, 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 uh, the, the policymakers through the work that we are doing. Uh, in collaboration with the universities and other research researchers, because uh, the the data that we produce uh, when we get the samples that are coming in, different samples, whether it is crops, whether it is uh, a, a particular tree, sp tree species or or a livestock breed, we are able to guide through uh, sequencing DNA sequencing technology. Uh, we can be able to apply. Uh, many applications for, for example, crop improvement of, uh, uh, for resilient drought tolerance. Uh, through through sequencing that is genotyping, we are able to identify uh, a lot of wild as like for example, we get award sections that have markers for for drought tolerance, and we can be able to promote these crops crop varieties to farmers and tell them that this is what you can this is what we found this crop has. The marker for drought tolerant, we would advise you to to actually plant this seed, and we also working with the seed companies, so that the at the end of the day, when the farmer is going to buy the seed at the at the at the at the, at the, at the agrovet, um, the seed is already tested and it is known maybe for it's able to maybe resist a particular pest or a disease. Uh, also at SECAT, we, we also offer genetic diversity studies, uh, which is very important in terms of uh, knowing the material that we have in Africa. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, diversity among uh, our natural ecosystem. So a lot of studies have been done uh, towards conservation of, uh, of, of indigenous, in, you find we have a lot of indigenous uh, crops, indig indigenous uh, species that are, are able to withstand climate, and this is what we there is a lot of research that is going on that is very helpful in terms of mitigation. Uh, our company, th this is what we have been able to do. Uh, we are based in uh, at Nairobi, but our partners are uh, come from different. Uh, uh, African countries, we work with universities, also uh, research institutions, and um, we will be very happy to collaborate. Uh, the, now I go to the second point on uh, community engagement and capacity building. So we need to continue to educate our community towards climate resilience and how they can be able to adapt. So facilitate involvement in climate research and adaptation, ensure to ensure um, uh, strategies to ensure the inclusion of indigenous knowledge. So it's good to get uh, information from the local people and know what, what, what has been happening and the changes that they have served. And through this documentation, we are able to, to note um, any changes that are happening. So conduct trainings to build the capacity of uh, local communities in terms of uh, through NGOs uh, to become climate resilient. That is, for example, floods, mitigation, involve the community, also promote sustainable agricultural practices. That is, uh, for example, um, uh, natural resource utilization, water management, uh, agroforestry, all these are part of uh, what we need to focus on. Uh, for the another point that I thought uh, it's important is on policy development and implementation. 
uh, we need to develop and implement policies that address climate change policy impacts and uh, promote sustainable development. Establish the regulation of land use, water management, and disaster risk um, reduction that consider climate factors. So um, the policy is very important because uh, for residents, for example, I would say in Kenya, uh, we have um, most of our, our staple food is maize, and uh, this maize is used in so many applications. We can apply maize, maize. I mean, as food for as flour. We also eat something. Uh, I, I know most of your conversation with ugali. So we are trying to. There is a policy that is going on where where there is called Kenya flour blending policy. So it aims at to promote the blending of sorghum, not only focusing on one crop. You know, uh, we, we can be able to get flour from uh, different uh, different varieties of crop. I know in Nigeria and West African countries, they, they consume a lot of cassava. So trying to have this diversification of uh, not only relying on one crop, uh, diversifying to different crops like sorghum. You know, sorghum has a lot of, uh, it's known for to become tolerant and also mirant. And these ones can be substituted to maize. So we need to promote such kind of policies. Uh, the other thing is a policy promoting the growth of a most suitable crop in, in similar areas will, will immediately affect the farmers and more broadly the food supply chain. This will in turn affect the food environment, consumer behavior, and eventually food system outcomes. Uh, transforming the food system in sub-Saharan Africa to meet the green demands, uh, we require investment in priority areas, policies to support investment and uh, institutions uh, uh, and institutions to support implementation. For example, a uh, policy that is focusing on livestock improvement program, uh, we need to also guide. We need to we need to have these policies because uh, a lot of uh, farmers who are in semi and semi arid and arid areas rely on most of these people are pastoralists and rely on on their goats and 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 cattle for their livelihood. So it is very important that we have uh, regulations that are able to uh, to guide on animal health and diagnostic disease surveillance and quality control. So that we are able to avoid um, pandemics of uh, of diseases, for example, East, East Coast East Coast fever and other uh, other uh, diseases and pests that are related to as a result as a result of climate change. Uh, in terms of policy, also I came across um, the issue of uh, unstructured unstructured marketing system uh, that have a negative impact on the agriculture industry leading to its underperformance. So producers and marketing groups need to strengthen their cap capabilities in producing, processing, and storing crop and livestock products. As the livestock policy state is, states, it is important to facilitate the dissemination of livestock marketing information to all value chain actors and to establish mechanisms for strengthening and harmonizing market information system and developing linkages with local and international markets. So yeah, we need to also develop this in terms of uh, how we trade within ourselves, so that when we have maybe surplus, for example, when in in Tanzania they have uh, surplus maize, how 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 can we be able to support our neighboring countries in terms of uh, uh, buying from them instead of uh, their their produce going to waste, maybe because of strategy issues. So there's a lot of things that we can streamline there in terms of uh, marketing systems, infrastructure. Another point. Uh, we need to have capacity to develop our infrastructure. Uh, for example, early, uh, develop and implement early warning system for extreme weather. For example, the recently we had a Nino rain. So we need to be prepared in terms of uh, capacity to deal with disasters. Invest in res resilient infrastructure such as uh, flood control, water storage, uh, river management, and flood mitigation infrastructure. Which is lacking uh, in Africa. This increases the chances of flooding, uh, yeah, without um, improving the availability of water during the dry season. So you find that at one one point we are complaining we have floods, but after six months we are also having issues to do with uh, drought. Inclusion and technology. 
uh, is another thing that we need to, to focus on. So when I say about inclusion is that we need to engage the youth and uh, they, uh, we have youth and women, we, they are left behind when it comes to uh, how, how they can be able to help to become for, for communities to become resilient. You know, youth, uh, we have uh, Africa has the youngest uh, population in terms of the youth uh, bracket and who are also having challenges of unemployment. So we need to have policy that is, that is helping in terms of uh, capacity building uh, youth in terms of their agribusiness produce, produces. So governments need to support the youth. This way, um, we are able to combat issues of uh, drought and people dying because of hunger and malnutrition. We need to facilitate the transfer of climate resilient technologies to Africa. So, for example, like what we are doing here at um, at our at SEC at Africa, it needs to be translated. We need to support this information needs to get across to researchers and uh, different national research institutions across Africa countries, so that we can be able to to have uh, products and services that are helping our consumers. I mean, our farm, farmers and uh, also government. Uh, farmers and herders can adopt new technologies or practices to reduce their exposure to climate induced risk and adapt to climate change. But this requires investment in rural and agricultural development, particularly in these Aryan technologies as drought terrain cultivars. Uh, irrigation, we need to have irrigation um, systems that can be able to support, which are sustainable. And uh, I mentioned about the, the water. When you have floods, you need how to mitigate this water and also maybe have dams that we can be able to to tap, we can be able to harvest the water and use it during the dry season. Uh, yeah. So we also need to know that, um, for example, in Kenya, we have, um, I mean, uh, the use of M-Pesa and uh, M-Pesa is, is, a, is a mobile, uh, for those who don't know M-Pesa, M-Pesa is a mobile app that we, we use it for transacting uh, cash, I mean, final money is it. So instead of going to the bank, use an app. So we, there's a lot of innovativeness that is happening across the tech, uh, technology space. And uh, we need to also to think of how we can be able to use technology for such as um, the internet, SMSs to communicate when we have, I mean, when we have, uh, we are expecting disasters and to, to, so that we are able to prepare ourselves in advance. Uh, the other point is on education and awareness. Uh, we need to have education, uh, teaching uh, young people and and uh, engage this in the curriculum uh, so that, that people are aware about their, the impacts of climate change and how we can be able to adopt towards it. We need to promote sustainable lifestyle and practices within communities to reduce their carbon uh, footprint. Uh, encourage climate change education at all levels. So that is from primary schools to higher education, uh, higher education uh, institutions such as, such as universities. The other point was on, on uh, financial mechanism. We, uh, for us to be able to uh, to be climate uh, resilience and the issue of also policy, we need to have um, insurances. Uh, we call, what do you say? We call it insurances to help. Uh, protect uh, farmers when we have uh, yeah, catast catastrophes such as drought. So climate insurance can help build resilience and reduce this risk that smallholder farmers cannot manage through better practices and technologies. By providing farmers with insurance for more severe drought and other natural hazards, we help protect the investment and potentially increase investment and uptake. So insurance is, is true that they help build um, resilience for smallholder farmers and protect them against risk that uh, that 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 is, that is on the farm. Um, we need to have policies that um, I mean um, we, that are that are related towards um, cushion in farmers uh, in terms of when the disasters disasters come because you know as a, as a small farmer. Uh, they they have a lot of uh, they have invested a lot in the in the farm, but at the end of the day you find uh, the 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 crop is affected probably because of drought or flood. So through this way we are able to uh, become a resilient community. Uh, 
Complete mechanism to drought and floods have been achieved using uh, financial instruments such as uh, FinTech. That's one of our companies that's also offering, uh, uh, is also able to build resilience towards community that are, that are experiencing uh, the issue of adaptation because they have they have early warning system, they have uh, weather index insurances, they have a lot of products that they can help uh, manage, uh, they can help farmers uh, when when need when there is a need for it. We need also to establish climate finance mechanism to support adaptation projects and initiatives. Um, engage with the international organizations and donors to secure funding for climate resilience program. The next point was on uh, ecosystem conservation and restoration is also related towards uh, resilience. Uh, we need to promote um, and conserve our natural ecosystems, such as forests and wetlands to enhance climate resilience and uh, diversity. Uh, the picture that I have shared there is a little bit blunt, but um, it's a wetland. And the wetlands are known to have, um, they act as buffer for floods. When there is flood, uh, the wetlands uh, act as, as, as buffer and they control the flood. And also when the, it is dry, the wetlands are very important because uh, they act as source of water. So, uh, but unfortunately in African countries, you will find that most of these wetlands, I'm, I'm actually saying that because we have a project that we are involved in at the community level on wetland conservation, you find that at the community level, people don't really appreciate uh, the wetlands. They see it as a wasteland. And uh, even you find that the community is also, some community you find that they are bringing even soil to just bury the, they don't, they don't want that wetland. They don't want the, they just see it as a health hazard. But in reality, it's something that is very important towards carbon uh, sequestration. You know, it's a, the, the importance of wetlands cannot even be emphasized. So we need to have policies uh, where like government gazettes these kind of uh, natural systems, ecosystems such as wetlands so that the public uh, is aware about uh, this is a protected area and no one is supposed to go there. Uh, so through, through research and uh, documenting that it is the kind of, of uh, natural uh, ecosystem that we have uh, the, the public is able to be, you know, we can be able to change the mindset of, of the public uh, so that they, they, they don't see such kind of uh, ecosystems as, as, a, as, as a threat or as a nuisance to them and they're able to uh, conserve them. So implement sustainable land management practices to prevent also issues to the deforestation and degradation, encourage the creation of protected areas that act as buffer. Yeah, so in terms of conservation, we need to encourage a win-win situation whereby also the community are able to benefit from the conservation. It's not just only conservation, but also see what is the, 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 the direct benefit that they are getting. Uh, my other point was on, uh, the last point actually is on sustainability. So we need to support and encourage a stronger focus on uh, policy coherent framework for food security, adaptation, and disaster risk reduction. We also, I mentioned about the technology. We also need to digitize uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, whatever we are doing. What, what, whether it is mechanization and digitization that goes hands on hand. We need to we need to embrace technology when it comes to to farming, we need to encourage uh, smart, fa smart smart farming uh, across our small, small, sm I mean, we have small farms, so we need to encourage more of smart farming so that we're able to conserve also the little space we have, but at the same time, maximize it. I uh, also said about the research must be timely to be relevant. So for it to help the farmers and the researcher, I mean, the policy makers and everyone and, and the community, the research must not be put in the shelves. After you are done in the research, you need to go out and you need to publish it and, and maybe share it with the community and the public and the policy makers. We also need to have a continuous rapid response uh, when disaster and uh, 
and um, we have um, yeah when they have disasters and because for example uh in Kenya we have a a program whereby the government was offering like a subsidy for fertilizer to the farmers so this one has been documented that through the fertilizer subsidy the small farmers smallholder farmers i mean they, we have had a lot of agricultural productivity has increased so when because you know when we have a situation and there is some intervention we need to have these interventions happening uh continuously so as i conclude uh i would say that by integrating these strategies african nations can enhance their resilience to climate change uh, protect vulnerable communities and promote sustainable development so we need to collaborate between uh, governments. We also need to collaborate between the universities, the research institutions, NGOs, local communities for us to be successful. That's that's in my presentation. I don't know whether you have any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Samuel, for that insightful presentation. Uh, right now, what has come out very clear is uh, while looking at building resilience in this community, the first thing we need to do is do a vulnerability assessment. Like how are these people vulnerable? What do they need and what capacity building level do we need to get to do to them? Also the part of information, knowledge sharing, information as well, and promoting of solutions that's, that come out very clear. Uh, what else? Uh, the other thing that I realize is like the researchers and these policy makers, they really need to work together in coming up with these policies that uh, will enable the diversification or rather uh, that will promote resilience, especially in diversifying on the species or rather investments that can be done at each level. So thank you so much for that presentation. I will really welcome anyone who has a question or a comment on the same. Uh, please feel free to either raise your hand or rewrite in the comment section. I'll read it for you. The floor is open. Uh, I'll welcome Washington Kanyangi. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, Lavenda. Uh, thank you, Samuel, for uh, that thought-provoking presentation. So mine is just to uh, build on your presentation. So I, I agree that um, the role of research in building resilience against climate risks uh, caused by climate change is imperative, but Another key aspect uh, is disseminating this information to the vulnerable groups. Um, the findings should be packaged in a way that it can be comprehended by the targeted group. So in addition to that, uh, while translating this information, it should be co-created by the locals, you know, so to avoid misinterpretation, misinformation by the target audience, this is very key. This is very key in eliminating maladaptation. So for instance, protecting the wetlands, as you mentioned. Then again, um, how, how do we establish uh, frameworks that are key in adopting new ideas, new adaptation technologies, so, so that they can be synthesized and appraised for purposes of improving existing environmental and agricultural technologies. This is very, very key. Then, then um, I'll just end by saying that um, creating robust value chains for agricultural products uh, is, uh, is very key. You, you know, it's very key in attracting adaptation investments uh, in the food security sector. Infrastructure, um, comes in, you know, um, so good roads means uh, fresh produce gets to the market in time. This is uh, key in ensuring adaptation initiatives, you know, the, the value chains ensures that the adaptation initiatives are sustainable even after the implementation cycle comes to an end. So um, there's just so much to say about, or rather there's so much that comes to mind 
about this topic, but I will just end there. Thank you. Yeah, so I agree with you. Uh, actually, when I was doing my presentation, I was when I was preparing the presentation, I had so many points that were, I had so many points that came across, for example, the for infrastructure. And um, yeah, I was actually reading about how how infrastructure affects people in the western, uh, I mean, uh, semi and uh, semi arid and arid regions where they they have uh, their livestock uh, products and they need to bring them to the market. So it is very important that we 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 have this kind of uh, uh, setup uh, in 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 our system. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your comments. Do you have any other maybe question? Thank you so much. Uh, I'll welcome Dr. Gavi. I think he has a comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, today's presentation was very insightful and uh, very significant uh, when it comes to the global uh, problems that are affecting us as humanity, and especially the climate change issue. The presentation has been good. Uh, we have seen how research plays a very significant role in, in trying to address these aspects uh, to, in, within the agriculture sector, among other things. Uh, perhaps maybe uh, in addition to what Washington has put across, uh, the innovation part needs to come out very strongly, of, of course. We need to be innovative uh, develop innovative approaches that can really uh, address these issues. Uh, there are organizations that have already developed, like for example, the apps, mobile apps. For example, there is one called the iShamba. Every weekend I get a message that tells me the amount of rainfall that may rain in my area. And so these innovations, of course, they will also blend with the already developed early warning systems, among other things, to address these aspects of climate change. So in addition to just investing in the value chains, research is very important, but we really need to see how to integrate this research with policy makers and how do we bring in the community, the recipients, who are the receivers of this information? How do we ensure they receive this information and synthesize this better to ensure that we try to address this global problem? Thank you. Yeah, uh, in addition to what Dr. Agebi has said, Agebi has said, uh, thank you very much for the comments. Um, yeah, uh, we actually at SECAT, at our, our, our organization where I work, uh, we've had issues to do with um, quality control. Actually, we do quality control in seeds. You find that uh, most of the seeds that are being sold um, at Agrofit are not, do not meet the quality. I mean, they're not pure seeds. So you find a farmer is going and, and buying a particular variety. They plant that variety, but it end, it does not end up uh, giving the right quantity. I mean, in terms of production, and you find that we have a lot of sick, uh, fake seed uh, circulation in the market. This affects a lot of um, uh, farmers because farmers are not aware because they just go to the agrovet and they buy the the seed. So we have had a lot of studies that are going on in terms of uh, doing quality control of uh, the seeds uh, being uh, distributed uh, across the ag agrovets in the in the country. So we need definitely to promote um, uh, this kind of technology innovations uh, so that they can be able to address and help uh, farmers uh, on the ground. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, at this time, I'll welcome Jim. I don't know if you are at a position to say something. I really wanted you to, to link the two. The, the other week we talked about uh, assessing the perspective of the community community members to climate change how is their attitude how do they what do they know about this thing and what is their knowledge like the how do they incorporate both the the traditional knowledge and the knowledge gotten from the books so right now we're talking of building resilience i, I really well welcome you to uh, link this to how can this be made possible so that we move to the next step of now getting to the innovative adaptation strategies
Okay, is unable to speak, fine. Uh, but anyone can answer that. Um, Samuel, is it possible you just help us link the two together? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I would approach it in, in such a way that uh, I will just give an example for a project that I've actually worked on, that is uh, a wetland, a local wetland that is in our area. Um, and um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, okay, the, the people who live around, uh, across, uh, along the side, the riparian landowners, for example, for the wetland, um, they are very important in terms of the conservation because uh, even as we come as researchers and because I normally find a lot of people who are the ecologists who are going there to assess the the ecology, I mean the the biodiversity of the wetland, you, you find that the local the local knowledge about the place, uh, they tell you there's a lot of history, the that is a lot of information that they tell you that uh, this wetland had had this kind of species, had had this is how the water used to be. And um and it's I, I would say we cannot be able to ignore the fact that uh, the traditional knowledge and the local communities are key in terms of conservation uh, towards uh, ecosystem or mitigating the effects of climate change. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fine. And that's why uh, my colleague Washington came up with this idea of having the community to co-create these resilient uh, strategies. Uh, it's fine. So I don't know if there's any other question that we're leaving behind. If not, I'll welcome our executive director, Dr. Teller, to give us the closing remarks. Um, I, I, Lavenda, I don't know whether King is in the call. He's not, she's not, sorry. Is not okay, so maybe I'll just pick it up and say to uh, the presenter, thank you so much for your for your uh, for your insight. Um, as I said last time, these are topical areas that we need to explore further. So, uh, studies like this are crucial in terms of opening up um, the 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 Pandora's box, things that are hidden uh, and have not been properly researched, and especially in the context of, of, of Africa, and also being driven by the African uh, research community. Um, I think that is for us very critical because then we are able to tell our story and we are able to unpack some of the hidden issues that, you know, a lot of the top-down, uh, northern-driven theoretical approaches to research have not been able to unpack. And therefore, you understand why after many years of research in Africa, a lot of funding into research, still R&D progress is very poor, simply because we are not always sometimes researching the right things. We are sometimes um, you know, pursuing research topics that are actually answering irrelevant questions. But in this kind of pursuit, we are beginning to fix the engine and we are beginning to align the, the the ideas and thoughts to the real um needs and and expectations of Africa as a continent and I think from the perspective of Arin, this is what we want to see more and more not 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 because uh um, um it's a great research but because we are beginning to rethink our research agendas to be able to look at really what are the things that we need to dig up. And therefore, again, as Serene, the challenge that I give to all the researchers, the, 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 the young researchers who are making these presentations and doing their research in different areas, is to think about the bigger picture. What does all this mean? So we can have a case study here, a case study there. Last week, we, have a, we had a very interesting um, uh, presentation uh, on climate information system. This, uh, this, uh, this time, we've had a, another interesting one, almost along the same line. As these, you know, case studies and opportunities emerge, what big picture do we want to to tell? Because that is how we are going to make change, uh, so that we are we are we are able to uh, contribute to the thought leadership and able to really show what is important and what is critical with regards to Africa research and policy. And with those very few remarks, I want to 
take the opportunity to thank you so much, um, the presenter for making this presentation and the participants for making your time to be part of this discussion and to the Arin team, Lavenda for coordinating this. We are actually trying as much as possible so that we can make this better, stronger and more impactful because that is the, that's, that to me is what we need to target so that you know, all this we do, what do they mean? What do they mean in terms of uh, policy change? What do they mean in terms of knowledge change? What do they mean in terms of resource, uh, resource, uh, resource allocation and research investment? So this bigger picture is what, uh, as a reen, we want to work with you to build and be able to make noise in the bigger space around some of these empirical and contextual insights that are emerging from these uh, uh, studies. So thank you so much. And... Uh, until next time, may, may, may God continue to bless you and give you strength so that we can do more and more and, and uh, yeah. create impact. Back to you, Lavend. Okay, thank you so much, Director, for that uh, uh, insightful closing remark. Uh, at this time, we'll just uh, close our meeting for today. I'll request everyone to turn on your videos so that we can take a group photo. Uh, let's all turn on our cameras. And you can also give a good smile. <laughs> okay, so in a count of one, one, two, three, and give a smile. Okay, that's done. Thank you so much for attending today's session. Let's uh, touch base next week, same time. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you so much. Lovely week. Thank you. Bye.